I'm Charlie Sykes, and I'm not running for president, even though just about everybody else is these days. Sunday Insight starts right now. Good morning and welcome to Sunday Insight. In the week that was, Scott Walker makes it official, launching his presidential bid in Waukesha. The state Senate approves a modified Bucks Arena plan by a vote of 21 to 10, sending it on to the state assembly. Another horrific shooting at a military base, this time by a Kuwaiti native named Muhammad Yusuf Abdul Aziz, and a Wisconsin man is one of the victims. A top official with Planned Parenthood is caught on tape discussing the sale of fetal body parts, prompting calls for federal and state investigations. President Obama unveils a nuclear deal with Iran, and Brett Favre is inducted into the Packer Hall of Fame. But first, we start with the state Supreme Court's ruling shutting down the secret John Doe investigation that had targeted conservative groups in Governor Scott Walker's campaign. In a sharply worded 4-2 ruling, the court ended the probe saying that the legal theories of the prosecutors were, quote, unsupported in either reason or law. Prosecutors, led by Milwaukee's attorney John Chisholm, had launched a criminal investigation into whether conservative groups had illegally coordinated their campaigns with walkers during the recall fights over Act 10. But the court was sharply critical of what they said was a legal attack on constitutionally protected free speech, the extraordinarily broad subpoenas that netted millions of documents, and the pre-dawn paramilitary raids the prosecutors had conducted on the homes of conservative activists. The justices wrote in their opinion, quote, it is utterly clear that the special prosecutor has employed theories of law that do not exist in order to investigate citizens who were wholly innocent of wrongdoing. The justices noted that armed deputies had seized business papers, computer equipment, phones, and other devices, while their targets were restrained under police supervision and denied the ability to contact their attorneys. The items seized include documents that had nothing to do with politics or campaigns, including wholly irrelevant information such as retirement income statements, personal financial account information, personal letters, and family photos. The Supreme Court ordered Chisholm and the other investigators to return all of the personal property they seized. Let one point be clear, the state, support, the state Supreme Court ruled, our conclusion today ends this unconstitutional John Doe investigation. Joining me on our panel this morning, Defense Attorney Dan Adams, Brian Sikma from Media Trackers, former Milwaukee County Board Member Linda Bruin, and Colin Roth, the managing editor of RightWisconsin.com. Okay, Dan Adams, you're the defense attorney. Did they get the right? Did they make the right decision? Supreme Court uh, of Wisconsin did come to the right conclusion. This uh, investigation probably should have never started. There was John Doe one, right. which they wrapped up. They didn't have a crime that they thought that they could bring in front of a jury. Uh, instead of uh, you know putting mm -hmm. that away, they started the second one. In America, you're supposed to investigate a crime and then find out who did right. who done it, right? In this uh, case, the Milwaukee County District Attorney's Office and the Special Prosecutor said, we know who done it, we just don't know what he done. Uh, and that's not American, that's not what we should do. Okay, Colin, Colin Roth, I mean, I think a lot of people you know, probably were expecting this outcome. Mm -hmm. I don't think people necessarily were expecting how strong the denunciation by the prosecutors will, was in, in, this, in this decision. It was absolutely strong, and it's got to be humiliating for John Chisholm and the special prosecutor, Francis Schmitz, to be slapped around this way. Um, and it was also interesting to see in the majority opinion how they actually praised people like Eric O'Keefe, yeah. one of the John Doe targets, for bringing this lawsuit, for challenging these things in court. He actually set them up as kind of heroes, which I thought was quite notable. Okay, Linda Bruin. Well, you know, I totally agree that the court made the case that a lot of, the, of what the prosecutor Execution did really didn't pass the smell test. You know, the amount of secrecy involved, which was unbelievably excessive. The, and as you pointed out in your intro, yeah. the amount of personal information they took. On the other hand, there's parts of this that, that of what the court did that doesn't pass the smell yeah. test to me other, which is the other side of the equation. In Wisconsin, Wisconsin's recusal standards for mm. judges to hear cases is so lax, it's one of the most lax in the country, which by the way was put in place by Republicans, that several judges that participated in this decision were allowed not to recuse themselves, to actually decide the decision well, in other States, well, they wouldn't. So well, I think well, the tenor of, of yeah. how nasty they yeah. were to the prosecution actually has a political component, and not to well, doesn't, it, it doesn't it, pass the smell it, test it, either. It, it, except that, of course, what, what the Democratic prosecutor in Milwaukee County did was to go after every conservative organization in Wisconsin. Based on your standard, you would not have a single judge that would ever be able to hear this. It, what, what struck you about this decision? You know, Charlie, when you look at this, this is something that you know, the state Supreme Court finally concurred with the federal courts yeah. on this, because we've had federal courts with right. judges appointed by both presidents in both right. political parties uh, that have ruled various aspects of this process uh, to be unconstitutional, and 
to be violating uh, uh, various uh, federal yeah. statutes. This long un American nightmare is over, and I think what needs to happen next is there needs to be a serious evaluation in the Milwaukee County District Attorney's Office of what they're going to do to fix this problem. I think there's also a challenge to the legislature here to change yeah. Wisconsin's John Doe statute. We have seen how it can be abused as a powerful instrument in the hands of, of a very partisan individual, yeah. which would be G.A. John Chisholm. It needs to be reformed. Well, one of the interesting things in, in the court, it, it, it said that, that unless this law was clarified, then nobody in, in Wisconsin could be sure when they were running for office or engaging in political debate that they weren't committing a crime, that you would mm -hmm. be at the whim of the prosecutors. One of my questions, of course, would be why it took so long for the court to get around to making a decision on this, because the ruling in the end was not different from what the presiding John Doe judge had said a, a year and a half ago, and it's not different from what the U.S. Supreme Court has said and what, what, and, and what the Seventh Circuit Court has said. You know, what's, what's amazing is how long it went on and how extreme the investigation became. So what is your glass half full? What is your glass half empty? Let's go around the table, Dan Adams, you're first. My glass is half full because our president is making common cause with Republicans like Congressman Jim Sensenbrenner to start reforming <coughs> excessive prison sentences which affect nonviolent offenders at tremendous financial and human cost. My glass is half empty because even as we talk about reforming the criminal justice system for nonviolent offenders, actual violent crime in Milwaukee is out of control and our local political leaders, yes John Chisholm, seem to have no answers to address this crisis. Brian Sickman. Well, my glass is half full because the sanctity of all human life, including unborn life, is back on center stage thanks to a video showing a Planned Parenthood doctor casually discussing the organization's trafficking of aborted <laughs> infant body parts. My glass is half empty because this evil, barbaric practice exists and is tolerated in a supposedly modern civil society. Linda Bruin. My glass is half full because President Obama said what we all know to be true, <laughs> that Bill Cosby <laughs> drugging a woman to have sex with her is rape. My glass is half full because the four, uh, half empty because the 45 women accused of assaulting of that he's accused of assaulting will likely never see him spend a day in prison. Okay, Colin Roth. My glass is half full because Governor Walker's presidential campaign is really a testament to a lot of the things conservatives have accomplished here in Wisconsin. It's half empty because we will miss his presence, his voice, and his attention on future conservative reforms. Well, my glass is half full because local restaurant owner Joe Bartolotta actually turned down a $9,500 economic development grant from Wauwatosa last week saying, I don't need it. It's half empty because the guy is a unicorn. Almost nobody else turns down free money or corporate welfare these days because, you know, everybody does it. Everybody except Joe Bartolotta. Coming up on Sunday Inside, Governor Scott Walker making it official this week. He's running for president. Our panel will weigh in on his big announcement. Well, of course, last Monday, Scott Walker made it official. He's in. My record shows that I know how to fight and win now more than ever. America needs a president who will fight and win for America. Shops at Kohl's. Following the announcement, Walker embarked on a barnstorming campaign that took him to early primary states. So grade the launch, Brian Sickman. You know, I'm going to give it an A minus, and that no, has nothing to do with Walker. It's more of the presentation. I think the yeah. campaign's working on how are they going to package the candidate, how are they going to present it. I thought the governor, by the very fact that he memorized that speech and didn't use a teleprompter, it was phenomenal. I think the fact that he touched on a lot of big mm -hmm. issues was very good. Uh, I do think the warm up act was a little bit long, but it's fascinating to see the campaign using female surrogates, including Tonette, yeah. uh, yeah. to kind of attack Clinton. Okay, what do you think? Well, I think it depends on who you're, who's, yeah. who's the audience. I think yeah. for ultra-conservative Republicans, it was an A. Ultra. Or, or conservative ultra. Republicans, yeah. it was an A. But for <laughs> so moderates, independents, right. Democrats, it yeah. was clearly a failing grade. The bottom yeah. line is, I think he made he actually told us what his entire campaign strategy will, is going to be in one line when he said, if our reforms can work in a blue state like Wisconsin, they can work anywhere in, in America. And I think that is clear, the message that he's going to send, that what he's done yeah. here is going to work everywhere else. And I think that's a winning okay. line. Give him a grade. Yeah, I give him an A. Um, a lot of it has to do with uh, his, his resume and, and his reason for running is built on a lot of the yeah. things he's done here in Wisconsin. I think he has a very f effective uh, reason for running in, in saying that I can both fight and win. I think that's a very mm -hmm. effective line. Okay, I give him a BC, yeah. a passing grade. Mm -hmm. He got a little bump in a Friday yeah. Fox News poll, so that, uh, mm -hmm. he gets a pass for that. Uh, but his greatest strength is being so disciplined. I mean, he's telling the same cool story again yeah. and again and again. Yeah. He's he's not, even made the Tonight Show Jimmy Fallon. <laughs> yeah. ne never getting off script. But that's yeah. also his greatest.
greatest downfall when in a debate is he going to be able to think on his feet and turn around? I, 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 I thought the, I thought the rollout was very effective, and they started at 5 a.m. on Monday, you know, tweeting it out, and he dominated the news for you know for, for 24 hours. Mm -hmm. That really couldn't have been done that much better. His first week, I'd have to downgrade him to about a B minus. They got himself screwed up on another one of these social issues, asking about the the uh, Boy Scout policy on on gay leaders, and he you know gave an answer. Well, he supported the old policy because he wanted to protect kids, and people said, "What are you saying?" And then he backed off, and he said, "We'll protect them from the media." And then he had a oh, woof. It was one of those where you know sometimes do not try to be clever by half. But you have to say that on balance, he had a pretty good week. I mean, you you had that rollout, which I think was was well orchestrated. You had the Supreme Court ruling ending the John Doe investigation. You had a lot of love from people like uh, P Peggy Noonan. Him. But, uh, you know, there is that question about, you know, are some of those dumb speeches going to get old, Colin Roth? Uh, well, they're, no. they're, they're certainly to old us. to us yeah. because we've, right. we've heard them for probably two or three years at this point. But, you know, a lot of those anecdotes yeah. you talk about, the Coles one is very, very effective with right. middle class voters. Um, and uh, Yeah, I when's the last time Hillary Clinton bought anything? If you <laughs> yeah. ask Hillary Clinton, what, what is a loaf of bread cost? What, you, what you is think Coles you have cash? A right. Exactly. <laughs> but when, yeah. when he ticks down that list of all the things they've accomplished yeah. here in Wisconsin, it is an impressive list that I think even a lot of us take for granted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think on the, on, the, on the debates, he's not necessarily going to shine. He's not going to burn red hot, but he's going to be that steady guy. And I think the strategy's got to be that, you know, you be the last man standing, you be and, acceptable. And he just simply has to tout those results. Yeah. You look at everybody else. This is a guy who's very conservative, right. coming from a purple state. Right. That's really what the Republican Party needs right now as a national right. candidate. Okay, you may not want to hear it, but we will tell you anyway. Let's hand out some unsolicited advice. Dan Adams, you're first. To County Executive Chris Abley, you're in the catbird seat for determining how the Park East development will go down. Make the most of this power and reject any plan that creates huge surface parking lots. This public property is too valuable to become parking lot east. Brian Sickman. Well, my unsolicited advice is for Wisconsin Senate Democrats. Don't attack Republican-backed tax cuts for employers and call them giveaways to corporations when you turn around and vote to give the Milwaukee Bucks, owned by billionaires, hundreds of millions of dollars in taxpayer money. Linda Bruin. Economists say that the combined wealth of 1% of the world's population will soon be greater than the combined wealth of the entire rest of the world. I agree with the Pope who says this extreme wealth inequality is morally wrong. And with terrorism experts who say this inequality destabilizes national economies and is a leading cause of extremism. Colin Roth. My advice is for District Attorney John Chisholm, resign. <laughs> The John Doe investigation was an absolute disgrace, and your social justice experiment here in Milwaukee is putting real people at risk. Mm -hmm. hmm. Well, my advice to the leaders of the state legislature, the Supreme Court decision on the John Doe could not have been clear, but now it is up to you to blow up the Government Accountability Board, reform the John Doe law, and fix the state's campaign finance law so that citizens will know that free speech is not a crime. Still ahead on Sunday Insight, plans for a new Bucks Arena are moving forward, but it's going to cost fans a little bit more to go to the game. Can it save Milwaukee's pro basketball team? Plans for a new Bucks Arena clear a major hurdle by a surprising 21 to 10 vote. The state Senate approves a modified plan to provide $250 million in taxpayer support for the new facility. The bipartisan vote took place after senators added a $2 ticket surcharge and stripped out a controversial plan to use uncollected debt to cover Milwaukee County's $4 million annual contribution. The measure now goes to the state assembly. Uh, your reaction, Linda Bruin? Well, I, th I think the $2 surcharge yeah. is what was the linchpin to the you entire so? deal. Yeah. And I think that part of that is seen in the margin. The margin originally, yeah. they only needed 16 votes and they got 21. Right. And I think that uh, people like me, who had been really, in, and yourself, who had yeah. been opposed to a lot of the components of the plan, now if I had to vote it, I'd vote in favor you of it. You so would vote absolutely in favor of At it. this point, I think there's still pieces of it I don't like, yeah. but the bottom line is that sur surcharge, I think, put the onus back, or part, a small part of the onus back and the people who should really have been paying for this stadium, which are the people who use it. Okay, the, the, the Bucks owners were about the only people the Bucks president was saying that, that the surcharge might, what, what, I don't remember what his phrase was, but he, he thought it might, it might lower attendance. I don't know anybody outside of the Bucks that think the $2 <laughs> surcharge no. is going to make that much of a difference. Were you surprised, though, that you had Chris Larson, you had Lena Taylor, you had uh, Nikki Harris uh, Dodd all vote in favor of this? I, I, I think that came as a kind of a surprise. Were you surprised by, by that vote? I was, but I was I was surprised by their justification, how they hung their hats on taking out this debt right. uh, proposal, which is really still out there because the county executive right. 
can always ask the state to do it anyway, right. and, the, and the county's still on the hook for $4 million yeah. a year, no matter what. Yeah. So they just got rid of the, the payback mechanism, which can still be added back in, which the county's still on the hook on, yeah. but they use this as their their, their reason to come off the fence on the, yeah. on the, on the deal. Why was this not as controversial? Why was opposition not as strong to this as, for example, to Miller Park? Those of us that went through Miller Park, that was a much higher profile, much tougher vote. In the end, this was, I mean, they got, they got two thirds of the vote in the state Senate. No, I was kind of surprised at the end of the day yeah. to see how many Republicans went with this. I think the fact that Democrats crossed party lines definitely helped get some Republicans. The ticket surcharge also helped because it kind of made it seem as if the, the, the fans right. of this team have some skin in the game now, but uh, I know at the end of the day that there was probably a lot of people that would have voted against it if it hadn't been for that ticket surcharge. Colin Roth. Yeah, a lot of credit goes to yeah. Jen Schilling and Scott yeah. Fitzgerald, the, the two leaders in the Senate, but I, I think it's just how it's been sold the entire time. It's been sold as something that will revitalize that area of downtown. It's not just an arena, it's an entertainment district, and I think that that nobody wanted to be the person who killed that. You know, th I think that is that is the key. When you look back on this, that this was not a, it was not sold as a standalone basketball arena, and as, as Miller Park was. Yeah. That in fact, when you made it into an economic development linchpin, and you look at this land, and and the Park East has been vacant for so long, and it has been it has been so dead, for them to be able to say, look, if you do this, we're going to create a billion dollars worth of, of development, really did make it. I mean, that 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 I think changed the game. It changed it changed the debate. But still, you got to give you have to give credit for the Bucks doing an, an, a masterful lobbying effort and for mm -hmm. the legislators to be flexible enough to understand what they had to change, how they had to tweak it in order to get these votes. And I do think that the, the surcharge, and you know, frankly, I think the surcharge could have been bigger. I mm -hmm. think the surcharge could have been um, you know, uh, maybe prorated so that the people who buy the you know, $150 seats pay a little bit more. But on the other hand, you know, as, you, as you point out, you, you took out the kind of the stinkiest elements of this. I'm, I'm glad you're yeah. coming out in favor of progressive taxation. <laughs> <laughs> that, that the guys with the nice seats pay a little bit more. Yeah. Well, <laughs> in, this, in, nice. in this particular particular phase, in this particular case, I mean, th this arena is being built for the benefit of generating more revenue from high rollers. I mean, right. th yeah. that's the whole point. The luxury box, the, the, first, right. the first 10 rows, those people, by the way, are not going to be dissuaded by a small <laughs> ticket <laughs> surcharge. And I understand why the Bucks have to say this. Is there any doubt in anybody's mind that this will go through the State Assembly? No. No doubt. Yeah. How long, how long will it take? Uh, I'm not sure how long it's going to take. I think it's going to be with the fewer Republicans supporting it as a percentage of the overall GOP caucus. Yeah, but, uh, I, I agree. So what is it you don't get this week? Let's go around the table. Dan Adams, you're first. Well, speaking of, I don't get State Senator Chris Larson's statement after the successful vote on the Bucks Arena plan. First, he complains about the process. That takes a misplaced dig at Governor Walker. Senator, we realize you're light on legislative accomplishments, but when you're in the end zone, Act like you've been there before. <laughs> Brian Sigma. Well, what I don't get is why the Obama administration would set terrorists free in order to secure the release of a soldier who abandoned his post in Afghanistan, mm. but won't require Iran to release Americans it currently holds hostage as part of a sweeping nuclear deal. Linda Bruin. Well, I don't get why Scott Walker would outlaw abortion even to save a mother's life. There are types of abortion we should oppose make it legal, and some will always debate, but every Republican president in recent history and the vast majority of Americans support abortion to save the life of a mother. Colin Roth. What I don't get is how some on the left can be such strong advocates of police and criminal justice reform, yet never once raise concerns about the tactics employed by the John Doe that included pre-dawn paramilitary raids, gag orders, and a massive seizure of digital evidence without ever telling the targets. Well, what I don't get is why we continue to provide taxpayer funds to Planned Parenthood even after it was found to be trafficking in fetal body parts. Now, if you haven't read the story of what's going on, you should probably wait until after you've had lunch. Next on Sunday Inside, our panel picks the winners and losers of the week. First, here's your morning news update. It's time for our panel to pick the winners and losers of the week. Dan Adams, you're first. My loser, left wing county board chairwoman Marina Dmitrievich who announced this week she is leaving the Democratic Party to become the executive director of a new third party called the Working Families Party. How bizarre. My winner is the Wisconsin GOP as a leftist third party is an idea that has been tried before to Democrats' huge disadvantage. Remember Ralph Nader? Remember the Florida recount? Anyone joining the Working Families Party is helping the GOP by proxy. That's awful. Brian Sigma. Well, my winners of the week are Wisconsin's working class families. Legislative Republicans led by State Representative Dale Cuenga included a $20.9 million tax cut in the recently passed state budget that reduces the so-called marriage tax penalty, a quirk that penalized married couples and families. 
Working class families will now pay less in taxes thanks to this reform. My losers of the week are the 15% of voters who, according to the Real Clear Politics poll average, are backing Donald Trump for president. A Trump presidency would be as disastrous as an Obama third term. Get a hold of yourselves and stop falling for this unserious demagogue. Linda Bruin. When a Republican presidential candidate starts campaigning in liberal strongholds before he's won the Republican nomination, he's either an idiot for wasting time and money on folks who won't vote in Republican primaries, or confident he'll be the nominee and is getting an early start on broadening his appeal. Last week, Jeb Bush started campaigning in Democratic strongholds, and while most other Republican wannabe candidates stayed with the party faithful and dodged r risky questions. It's too soon to know if Jeff, Jeb's strategy is a winner or loser, but it does tell us what he thinks. And Colin Roth. My winner this week is Scott Walker. He had a great week that started by signing the budget, announcing his presidential campaign, and the end of the long-running John Doe investigation that many hoped would be his bridge gate. On the other side of the coin, my losers this week are my friends on the left. You made Scott Walker a national force with the recall, and the end of the John Doe is a tough pill to swallow for a movement that convinced itself that free speech was somehow criminal. Well, my loser, we've talked about a Milwaukee DA, John Chisholm, and the other prosecutors whose partisan witch hunt of state conservatives was shut down by the high court. The justice said that Chisholm's legal theory was unsupported in either reason or law. Ouch. Winner, Eric O'Keefe, one of the former targets of that investigation who defied the gag order to expose the prosecutor's abuses and overreach. Last week, Obama, I'm sorry, O'Keefe, and the other targets were completely vindicated when the court declared them wholly innocent. Hey, thanks for joining me. And join us for my radio show Monday morning on News Radio 620 WTMJ from 8.30 until noon.